Welcome to the Bluffton Bible Cast, where together we embark on apocalyptic adventure through the prophets and revelation. Though it is a daunting task, we encourage you to embrace the challenge and find captivating truths from the mysterious parts of God's Word. Thanks for joining us. My name is Joe Lehman, and I'm joined today by Taylor Kirshner and Andy Stoller. Rodney Pelzi is our audio tech. Well done, listeners. You're to be congratulated. You've stayed faithful to the reading plan all year. You should be proud of yourself. This week, we'll cover Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament prophets. And on Friday, on our way to Revelation next week, we're going to have a layover in Matthew to hear prophecies from the God-man himself, all in preparation for our adventure into the book of Revelation. Taylor, thanks so much for doing the research on the book of Malachi for us this week. What can you tell us to draw us nearer to this part of God's word? Well, Joe, there's only so much I can do in three minutes, but let's go over the basics. We believe Malachi was a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah. There is some debate over this, but evidence suggests with the parallels of each prophet's harsh words and the same old sins that dogged the Jewish people that he would have been in this time period. Right. So those sins being like the corruption of the priesthood or the abuse of the least of these, the poor. Right. There are also other issues mentioned, like failure to tithe and intermarriage with idolaters. Right, but what is unique about the book of Malachi is the style in which it's written, right? Tell me what you mean there, Joe. I think I know what you're getting at, but how about you walk our listeners through it? Sure, Malachi was written like a conversation, like chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. But you say, How have we? How shall we return to you? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions you have robbed me. Right. This is not written in stanzas like a poem, but instead it's written in prose. These disputations, as they are called, seem to all follow a similar format. First, there's an assertion, followed by a challenge and a response. The assertion would be, for example, you have turned aside or you are robbing me. This is usually made by God or a prophet speaking for God. Then the next part, the challenge, is usually made by the Israelite people. How have we, right? They're trying to deny it. And then the last part is a response by either God or a prophet again and telling them how they have condemned them or forsaken God. And that's probably like the main message that the author was trying to get at. Right. After the conversation, then comes the main kicker. Yeah. Okay. I think I get it. Anything else you found this week? I'll do two more short things. The first off, and it's kind of a big one actually, is Malachi might not actually be the author's name. Wait, well, what? So Malachi actually means my messenger. So in one one, it says, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And it could really just mean the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by my messenger. Intriguing. If that was first, what was the second? I'm going to sound like a broken record, guys, but Malachi is a... Drumroll, please. Chiasm. (laughs) (laughs) There we go. I I got to hand it to you, Taylor. So you sure know how to find them. I figure chiasms are kind of like metaphors, symbolism, or parables. It's literary devices that are found all over the Bible. Well, I have heard some pretty great things about the author. (laughs) True. There's not really enough time to go into the depth of chiasm of Malachi, so I'll leave it to you, listener, if you want extra homework this week. I know my study Bible lays out the chiastic structure of Malachi in the introduction to the book, so I'll see what you can find. And if you do find an apex, come chat with me at church. I'd love to discuss it. So here we come to the highly anticipated, the often discussed Olivet Discourse. And I really appreciated this week how we started with Matthew 23 to help set the stage. Matthew 23 is the final recorded sermon that Jesus preached in the temple. The famous seven woes to the Pharisees. So how would you have liked to have been on the end of that sermon? Ouch. He really lets into them. He really does. So Jesus goes on in Matthew 23, verse 36, with a declaration that really helps establish context for the Olivet Discourse. Taylor, could you read that? Sure thing. Verse 36 says, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. 
The seven woes end with Jesus declaring that all the righteous blood that had been shed on the earth would be required of this generation. The woes and judgments would come upon the generation that heard Jesus preach. And so it's key to remember that Jesus is preaching in the temple. Right after he condemns that first century generation, he goes on further in verse 38 to say, your house is left desolate. It's really interesting that he didn't say my house Mm. because he had just referenced the temple as my father's house earlier in the Holy Week when he cleansed the temple. It had to hurt Christ's heart. We read in Luke 19 during the triumphal entry about Jesus weeping over the city and prophesying of its upcoming destruction. If only they had recognized him as Messiah. At the beginning of Matthew 24, so right after preaching the woes in the temple in chapter 23, Jesus and his disciples leave the temple when he famously declares that not one stone will be left on another. Shocked, the disciples later ask Jesus three very important questions on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24, verse 3. The first question is, when shall these things be? So I'm assuming here that they are referring to the statement Jesus had just made about no stone being left on another. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. The second question was, what shall be the sign of thy coming? For this one, it's really helpful to remember that the disciples were focused on Jesus's earthly kingdom restoration. Remember Acts chapter 1? Ah, yes. The disciples were focused on when Jesus would restore the kingdom to Israel. Jesus told them that they would not know, but instead they would be given the Holy Spirit. And then he ascended in the cloud. That's exactly right. So the disciples likely had an earthly focus with this question, but I would also encourage the listener to study the end of Luke 17, starting at verse 20 through the end of the chapter. And when you compare the warnings in Luke 17, you'll see that they're repeated later in the Olivet Discourse. So the disciples asked from an Acts 1 perspective, but Jesus answers consistently with his teachings from Luke 17. Hmm. For the final question, we need to go to the Greek, but I am not a Greek scholar by any means. The disciples were not asking about the end of the world or the globe. That would have been the Greek word cosmos. Wait, what? Yeah, so what the disciples asked, they asked, when is the end of the aeon? It's the same root word that we get eon from. So aeon doesn't sound like we're talking about the world anymore if it's with the same word eon. Right, right. So it's really unfortunate the Greek word aeon in verse 3 was translated as world in the KJV. The, in the original Greek, this word was a time-age question, not a global end-of-the-world question. The disciples ask, when is the end of the age? All right. It's also important to note that both Luke and and Mark record a much narrower set of context questions in their account of this same prophecy. When will these things be, those things being the stones, the stones being tear, tore down, and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Right, right. So with this reading this week in Matthew 24, before we even get to the rest of the text of the Olivet Discourse, these context questions are super important. And as a time-age question, the disciples asked this question during the Old Testament age, and as asked, seems like they were inquiring about the end of their present age. So when Jesus answers their question here, is he referring to the end of the Old Testament age, or what we might think of as the end of our current age? <laughs> so I, I think that question will be discussed until Christ returns, and I'm definitely looking forward to hearing more about the view that sees all of it as a type of judgment prophecy that's repeated throughout history. But Taylor, could you read for us Hebrews 9.26 to shed some light on the end of the age reference? Sure. For then Jesus would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world, or cosmos. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, aeon, to put away the sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yeah, so here in Hebrews, Paul indicates that the end of the ages happened when Jesus put away sin by sacrificing himself. The same word aeon is used in Hebrews 9.26 and Matthew 24.3. So it seems like this third question is about the ending of the Old Testament or temple-based age. I know these context questions can be very challenging for us. So we have three questions that set the context of the Albert Discourse When is the destruction of the temple? What's the sign of the coming of Christ in judgment as he prophesied? And when is the end of the Old Testament age? seems like there was one generation given between Christ's sacrifice and judgment in in order to preserve a remnant of God's people as he promised. To wrap up this section, I would like us to consider how the original audience responded. So a little bit of a history lesson here. So in August of 66 AD, 
the zealot faction in Jerusalem started a rebellion against Rome. And by November of that same year, um, a Roman general named Cestius Gallus, along with the 12th Legion of Rome, sacked their way across Galilee and Samaria and started their siege on Jerusalem to end the uprising. By God's divine will, Cestius Gallus was defeated and retreated, leading to a false sense of invincibility among the Jews at that time. Gallus's defeat led Nero to declare war on Israel in February of 67 AD. Three and a half years later, Jerusalem and over one million Jews were utterly destroyed. But when the early church saw Rome retreat, they left Jerusalem and were spared the complete devastation that was visited on the city and the people within the generation that heard Christ's prophetic warning in Matthew 23 and 24, that all these things would come upon this generation. We can take rest in the fact that Christ was not a false prophet when he spoke these words of warning to his disciples and the words of his coming in judgment against the generation that rejected him. The age of temple-based worship had come to an end. He is the only sacrifice needed for sin. So Joe, what would you say is the greatest challenge to understanding Jesus' words here in Matthew? The greatest challenge for me is how Jesus intermingles prophecies about the destruction of the temple with prophecies, what seem to be, about the end of all things. Yeah, that, that is confusing. Why would Jesus do this? I mean, it makes him seem like a false prophet, honestly. It seems like Jesus thought the end of the world would be soon after his ascension. Some Bible critics are really quick to make Jesus look bad here. Mm -hmm. But it turns out there are some good reasons why Jesus would speak like this, weaving the two events together. The first being simply that the disciples asked about the destruction of the temple and his return in the same breath at the beginning of chapter 24. Tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Kind of like we were talking about earlier. Hmm. Yeah, I can understand what you're saying. So what would be another reason Jesus would discuss these two events in such an overlapping manner? Well, you're on the road to answering your own question there when you said overlapping. Hmm. The destruction of the temple and the final return of Christ, those two events overlap theologically in such a way that things said about one can be true of the other as well. So exactly how does that work? How can a prophecy be fulfilled twice? Consider a passage in Isaiah, which we all consider to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Here it is. I'll read it to you. Isaiah 7. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. For before the boy will know to refuse evil and to choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Rationally, the prophecy given to Ahaz would have been fulfilled in his time. Mm. Right. It says right there that before the boy even wakes up or the boy even becomes of age, the two kingdoms, which were bothering Ahaz at the time, would have been forsaken. Okay. And that happened. Judah was not destroyed by Assyria and by Israel at that time. So the prophecy would have been fulfilled before that. There would have been some boy born to a young maiden who was named Emmanuel and he grew up, and before he even grew up, the kingdom, of a the kingdom of Samaria and Damascus, those enemies of Ahaz, would have been subdued. I see. So that would have been the first fulfillment then. The first fulfillment. But we always read that as a fulfillment of, uh, or a prophecy about Jesus, and certainly the New Testament authors think it is too. So yeah, so the, the prophecy to Ahaz was fulfilled in BC days because of the second part of the prophecy. But the first prof part of the prophecy was directly applied to Christ's literal virgin birth. Exactly. So some of the words we read this week in Matthew 24 have their fulfillment in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And just like our other example from Isaiah 7, some will have a more amazing fulfillment or a symbolic fulfillment when Jesus comes again as king. Some of these words will find their, their fulfillment in the end of all days or in both events, perhaps. I see your point here. I see how some of this stuff can have double fulfillment, but I guess I'm still struggling to see how the destruction of the temple and the end of the age are theologically connected. Neither did I at first. Consider that the ministry of Jesus was a sort of gospel message to Jerusalem. It was to the Jews and the God-fearing people of Rome at that time. 
after the message of Jesus was proclaimed to the Jewish community, and they were all given a generation to respond, judgment was visited on Jerusalem in 70 AD. In a similar fashion, the gospel is now going out to all the peoples of the entire globe. When that task is complete, we should expect another day of the Lord and expect a final judgment and the coming of Christ. All right, so I'm seeing the connection here. So just like the flood and the exodus are events which point to the final day of the Lord, so the destruction of the temple is a type of judgment which points to that day. Thanks for introducing us to this concept of the double fulfillment of biblical prophecy here in Matthew 24. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Listeners, thank you for tuning in to the Buffton Biblecast this week. We've enjoyed preparing this episode for you, and we pray that you have an amazing experience this week as you engage God's Word. Thank you.